It's often said, murder is not for the faint of heart, but it can be. A quiet day in Clinton, Indiana. In the small community hospital, caring nurses mend bodies and save lives. But lately, the team has been losing the battle. There has been an alarming rise in the number of sudden, unexplained deaths, triple the normal rate. Bad luck, bad medicine, sheer malpractice, or among the angels of mercy, an angel of death. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Administrative offices of Clinton General Hospital, a meeting behind closed doors. Head nurse Timmons, just back from maternity leave, has uncovered some alarming statistics. In her absence, patient deaths have skyrocketed. Last year, 51. This year, 167. She can't shake the feeling something is very, very wrong. Her boss calls the police. Uh, it was in the summer there of 1994 in which the death rate uh, just jumped tremendously. Uh, patients were dying uh, sometimes uh, three of them at a time. Nurse Timmons explains to police how she cross-referenced the times of death with the nurse's shifts. Certain nurses tend to be on the job more often when people die. Still, it could be anybody, a doctor, a technician, an orderly. She describes how she checked data from separate reports, always with the same chilling result and the same cause of death, sudden heart failure. Nurse Timmons can't believe it herself. But she knows that numbers don't lie. Clinton police begin an immediate investigation. You collect your evidence, your key evidence, your, your physical evidence, and you only have one shot to get that evidence. And if you, you miss it, uh, it's probably gone forever. Investigators move quickly to seize ECG reports. The electrocardiogram charts of patients who died of heart failure. Nurse Valquez was on duty for 49 of the sudden deaths. Under questioning, she tells police they are missing something obvious. The intensive care unit treats patients who are very sick and very old. They often have fatal illnesses which go undiagnosed. In her opinion, the rising death rate can be explained by the aging population. Investigators continue to collect evidence. They seized the red box containing drugs used to revive victims of heart failure. Nurse Barton was on duty for 47 of the sudden deaths. She also mentions that patients are old and sick, but remembers some exceptions. In particular, a local resident, Adrian B., who arrived accompanied by her niece, Melanie. She complained about shortness of breath, but otherwise seemed to be in good health. She was advised to stay overnight for observation. The 
next morning, Nurse Barton was surprised to learn the woman had died of cardiac arrest. The investigator feels he's getting good cooperation, but he's no closer to the truth. Everything that goes through your head is the possibilities to why the death rate might have increased. Uh, had there been uh, a virus or something like that, maybe entered the hospital causing these deaths. Things don't always sometimes seem to be what they may be. If a person comes in for a broken arm and dies, uh, a, a day or so later, uh, just from a broken arm, something doesn't add up. Nurse Majors was on duty for 76 of the sudden deaths. But he's not working at the hospital anymore. He's taken a job at his parents' flower shop. Police discover Nurse Majors was recently suspended and had his nursing license revoked. Nurse Majors believes he's being set up as a scapegoat. Majors is openly gay. Clinton is a very conservative town. He won't talk to police on advice of his lawyer. But police talk to his co-workers and learn that Nurse Majors always took the longest shifts and the toughest cases. When situations threatened to get out of hand, he took control. Patients and families praised him for being compassionate and caring. Media reports of a police investigation at the hospital cause fear and disbelief in the community. <laughs> I know uh, Mary Alderson. I know David Abernathy. I know uh, James Blackburn. I know Ines Kogan. It was unbelievable that such a small community, something like this could happen right at our little hospital. Town residents, hospital staff, and relatives of the victims all demand a quick answer. But after the first 72 hours, the deaths remain a complete mystery. Confronted with 167 deaths, Bud Alcron is struggling with a question most unusual in the world of detectives. Was this a crime? And that was a major hurdle for us, and that uh, we had uh, patients who had died but was it natural death or was it homicide? After six months of investigation, local police are stalled. They have made no progress in finding out what caused the sudden deaths of 167 patients at Clinton General. State Police Detective Bud Alcron selects 16 of the most suspicious deaths. Perhaps the dead can tell their own tales. We exhume bodies from the graves and have them all topsy, and uh, let the medical doctors try to find uh, a cause of death. Families of the deceased agree to the gruesome task. They're desperate for the truth. Cause of death on the original certificates, heart attack. The autopsies tell a different story. When the doctors, the pathologists examined the, the bodies, uh, they would say that, you know, this was not a death by a heart attack. The heart's in good condition. Healthy hearts do not stop beating without a reason. This is a case of murder. Mass murder. Among the angels of mercy walks an angel of death. For hospital administrators, the news is a bombshell. They order the hospital closed. All the nurses, including Nurse Timmons, who triggered the investigation, are suddenly without a job. Their lives are in shambles. Most leave town. One stays to fight. Nurse Majors wants the world to know neither he nor his co-workers are to blame. His lawyer appeals to the media. The people really who work at 
uh, the hospital and absolutely convinced that no one was murdered at that hospital. No one murdered. But all Kron is determined to prove it is murder. He turns to world-renowned heart specialist, Dr. Eric Pristowski. Armed with the ECG files seized in the hospital, the doctor searches for the real cause of death. What I decided to do was to take each case and very carefully sort of start to take notes and document what was going on. He's looking for a common pattern in the heart rhythms, which would explain so many sudden cardiac arrests. And a lot is riding on the right answer. I always said benefit of the doubt to the nurse to prove it otherwise, because what do I know? I don't want to be the one to put an innocent person behind bars because I built a false case. While waiting for Dr. Pristowski's answer, Detective Alcron makes his next move. Look into the psychological profile of nurses who kill. And many of these people in hospital settings who do kill are playing God. These individuals are into power and control and get off on the mastery of other individuals. They have the power to decide who lives, who dies. Committing serial murder without being caught is the ultimate power game. The urge to kill can lie dormant for years until something acts as a trigger. Could be anything from stress to uh, job dissatisfaction to something that's happening in their life that's causing them more stress. There is a relationship between stress and, and acting out. In light of the psychological profile, the detective revisits what he already knows about the nurses and gets a new read on nurse majors. There had been an incident in the staff room, some black humor, poking fun at majors. Innocent enough, but the normally affable majors didn't find it very funny. It was reported to us, yes, that there was a personality change in him. Uh, more aggressiveness on his part, uh, more domineerance on his part, uh, uh, mood swings, things like that. Majors had a good reason to be under stress. He had just lost his longtime partner. He'd started visiting truck stops late at night, cruising strangers, living on the edge. Majors does fit the psychological profile, and he becomes the prime suspect. After months of analysis, while working at home late one night, the heart specialist has a breakthrough. I walked out of the library and came in and, uh, to the kitchen and said, uh, the son of a bitch killed him with potassium. Potassium chloride is commonly used by hospitals. In small doses, it controls an irregular heartbeat. But its use is highly restricted because it can be lethal. In large doses, it is used to execute murderers on death row. It's the only chemical that can cause a perfectly healthy heart to flatline. But Alcron has a murder weapon and a suspect. The detective obtains a search warrant for Major's home. In Major's garage, he finds nine empty vials of potassium chloride. In Major's car, two more. A key find, but they could have been placed there by anyone. The detective sends the vials to Toronto, to the most advanced fingerprint lab in the world. In a vacuum chamber, the vials are bombarded with charged particles to reveal even the faintest fingerprint. The result? Inconclusive. Alcron is disappointed, but not surprised. I know it's easily portrayed in television shows where fingerprints are always available, 
I think in my 31 years of police work, I've only had two cases where I've been able to get fingerprints. Even as the police investigation tightens around him, Orville Majors is taking action to regain his nursing license. Detective Alcron is convinced that he has his man. But how is he going to prove it? Detective Alcron has discovered the diabolical method of murder for many of the unexplained deaths at Clinton Hospital. He suspects Nurse Orville Majors is the serial killer, but he still wonders why Majors might have wanted to murder these old patients. As we interviewed his friends, uh, we did learn that he uh, did not like old people. He felt that they were a burden on society. and made derogatory comments that they, you know, ought to be done away with. Detective Alcron uncovers a deep, dark secret in Major's past. As a young man, Major's had to take care of an elderly relative, day after day, until she passed away. Major's hated it, and his anger never died. Still, Alcron needs incriminating evidence to link Majors to the potassium vials found in his car. Alcron finds out that each vial of this lethal chemical is restricted to a single needle use only. Multiple needle punctures would indicate foul play. Once again, the detective turns to science. Toolmark analyst Mark Keisler knows his evidence will be key in court. I found multiple sticks in what was termed single-dose potassium chloride bottles. I found eight needle puncture sites in one potassium chloride bottle. These are only to be used one time. Here he was in possession of, of potassium bottles that had been used multiple times, which is wrong. It was not uh, according to their, their practice. And so it was just one more piece of uh, circumstantial evidence that we needed. Nearly three years after the beginning of the investigation, Detective Alcron arrests Orville Majors on seven charges of murder. Majors maintains his innocence, claiming the bottles of potassium have been planted. Alcron hopes he hasn't made a huge mistake. The prosecution has a murder weapon, motive, and opportunity but no eyewitness. The detective worries that circumstantial evidence alone may not be enough for a jury. Could they think that a nurse could be killing people? Can the jury comprehend that? It's not like a, a 38 revolver in your hand with a bullet and the, and the decedent who's just been shot. Uh, how do you show that that 38 caliber uh, weapon is a bottle of potassium chloride? And so yeah, our odds are, Again, we're against us going into the trial that uh, we didn't think it would win. For the families and the community, a lot is riding on the outcome of the trial. The day before closing arguments, Detective Alcron gets a call from Melanie B. A news report of the trial has jogged her memory of something she saw in the emergency room. Her eyewitness account could tip the balance for a jury. On a summer afternoon, her Aunt Adrian called, complaining of chest pain. Melanie rushed her to the hospital. Adrian was given a bed so she could rest comfortably for the night. Melanie tells Detective Alcron she left the hospital greatly relieved. The next morning, Melanie found her aunt in good spirits. Her aunt had slept peacefully and was eager to go home. 
A nurse confirmed that Melanie's aunt was going to be released later that day. Melanie went to arrange her aunt's discharge. Soon after, Orville Majors came for her. He said that her aunt had taken a turn for the worse. Melanie was shocked. She didn't question why Majors gave her aunt an injection. Melanie saw Majors kiss her aunt and heard him murmur, It's all right, Pumpkin. Everything is going to be all right. Moments later, her aunt was dead. Although still deeply grieving, Melanie is compelled to relive her aunt's death on the witness stand. These people were betrayed. They went into a hospital to get well, and they end up dying. And they were murdered there. The jury found Orville Majors guilty on six counts of murder. Although he chose not to testify, Majors maintained his innocence. He showed no emotion when the verdict was read. The sentence, 360 years in prison for the man everyone called the Angel of Death. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real. <laughs>